All right, take your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Samuel. <clears throat> it's been a while since we have uh, been in this book, so I just want to give uh, just uh, a brief overview, I guess, of where we are uh, in the book. So uh, we are in chapter 12 tonight is where we're going to be. We're going to cover the entire chapter. And up until this point, we've really just seen the life of Samuel. Uh, we saw how his mother begged God for a child and promised to give him back to God if he would answer her prayer. And so God answers her prayer. Uh, Hannah is faithful then to fulfill that vow. Uh, she didn't renege on it. She said, I'm going to do what I've, I've vowed to do. And she brings Samuel back to the temple. And we see Samuel who grew up under the mentorship and care of Eli. Uh, we saw Eli and his, and his sons not really following after the Lord, really not a great environment for Samuel to grow up in. Uh, they were really living evil lives. And because of their sin, God pronounces judgment on Eli and his sons and all three of them. Uh, die as a result of that judgment, two in battle, and one Eli again falling backwards, breaking his neck when he hears the news of the ark being taken. So then Samuel is recognized as the judge of Israel, and we walked all through that. He becomes the last judge of the nation, and he judges the nation, but the nation finally decides that they want a king instead of a judge. And this really, yes, it was a rejection of Samuel, but more importantly, it was a rejection of God as their king. So the last time we were in the book of Samuel, we saw the rise of a king. So we saw Saul come onto the picture, uh, the introduction of Saul, the crowning of Saul, how God orchestrated all of that to come together. And God had a perfect plan for the nation of Israel, uh, but they chose to go their own way instead. And so God gave them what they wanted. They wished for a king and God said, okay, fine, I'll give it to you. This is what you're looking for. And so that brings us to where we're at in chapter number 12. So if you've turned there, we're going to pray and we'll get started. All right, Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for another day in your house. Uh, Lord, thank you for the testimonies, Lord. Thank you for working, uh, Lord, in the hearts uh, of our teens, Lord. Thank you for what you've been doing in the lives of, uh, Lord, those who are at college, Lord, Bible college and secular college, Lord. We pray you'd continue to work, uh, Lord, in their hearts, continue to grow them, uh, to bring them closer to you, Lord, and, uh, Lord, to continue to uh, guide and direct them as to what you have for their lives. Uh, Lord, I pray that as we come to your word uh, tonight that you would... Uh, calm our hearts, Lord, that you would help us to uh, look into your word and see what you have for us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> have you ever thought about what your last words would be, anybody? <laughs> Not yet? We're too young for that? Okay. All right. You think about maybe, maybe it's your last uh, final speech that you give at work before you retire or a, a final time together with your family before you pass away. Uh, maybe just a once-in-a-lifetime chance to share something that you have learned. Nobody's ever thought of that before? I haven't. I was thinking it through as I was putting this together. I've never really thought of that before. Uh, there's a man named Randy Posh. Uh, he was a professor of computer science, human-computer interaction, and design at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, he was named Person of the Year by ABC News in 2007. Uh, he was named to Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World, uh, their list in 2008. But in 2006, Posh was informed that he had developed pancreatic cancer. Uh, after that diagnosis, they did a surgery trying to eliminate the cancer, but a year later, he was told that it had come back, it had met, uh, metastasized in his liver, and they only gave him three to six months to live. Uh, one of the things that Carnegie Mellon does, and I'm sure a lot of other universities do as well, is they, uh, they have a last lecture circuit is what they call it. Uh, they give professors who are leaving or retiring from the university a chance uh, to give a hypothetical last talk to everybody. Uh, they give them this last lecture, and for Posh, it really was his last lecture. After he gave this lecture, he worked with an author to put his lecture into words, and they created a book called The Last Lecture. And I read it a few years ago. It's a great book. But in his book, he recounts his life, the lessons he learned from parents and family, coaches, others. And really, he recounts as well in that book what he wants his young sons to know and to remember about their father. He wasn't very old. Uh, I had a different picture of him and his family, and his kids uh, were all young, probably all below 10 years old. And in his book, he says, I want them to know who I was, but I want them to remember these things as he gave his last lecture. It's a great book. It's one that makes you stop and think about your life. And as we come to Samuel, 1 Samuel 12, Samuel gives his final address, or if you want to think of it, his last lecture to the nation of Israel. After this moment, we don't really see Samuel much in the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to see him a little bit. He comes and he, he gives Saul some instructions. He also pronounces judgment on Saul. He anoints David. But we don't see him addressing the nation 
like we see him doing here in chapter 12 and we've seen him do before uh, earlier on in the book of 1 Samuel. And so he, we don't really see him again as this role as judge and leader of Israel. It's his final address, and yes, it comes from God. God gave this to him. And so the nation of Israel would have been wise to take note of what was said. And as we look at it tonight, this has come from God as well. So we would be wise to take note of what God says through Samuel. Samuel starts by giving his testimony. Look at verse 1 and 2. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that ye said unto me, and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed, and behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Basically, Samuel, again, he's pointing out the fact that this is a king that you wanted. Remember, we've gone through this. He says, this was your choice, not God's choice, not my choice. This is what you wanted. And so here, I've hearkened unto your voice, and I've made a king over you. And this is the official transition now from judges to kings. God's used judges for hundreds of years uh, as his instrument in judging and leading the nation. And now it's transitioning to kings and to a monarchy. And he gives his final words. He passes the leadership, mantle of leadership to Saul. And he says again, And now behold, the king walketh before you. <clears throat> and I'm old and gray-headed. And behold, my sons are with you. And I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken or whose ass have I taken or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? And I will restore it you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. Samuel takes the time to point to the testimony that he had before the people of Israel. He was the last judge, and he had judged faithfully. And really, his record stands in stark contrast to the record of Eli and his sons, even the record of Samuel's own sons. All these men had been corrupt. They had taken bribes. They had perverted judgment, is what we were told. And yet Samuel was able to stand up in his last address to the nation and say, hey, have I defrauded you? Have I oppressed you? Have I allowed myself to be bribed to look away or look the other way? And the response of the nation is clear and a resounding no. Samuel says, I've stood before you since a child, since my childhood, and I've lived a life that was without reproach. And that should be an amazing thought to think about. We don't know how old Samuel was at this point, but his entire life, he had lived and judged in such a way that there was nothing that anyone could point to and claim that he had done wrong in his judgment or in his treatment of the people. Really, this should be the kind of testimony that each one of us here should be striving to have. And my question, I guess, is under this point is, do you desire to have a life and testimony that are above reproach? All right, we know that this is something that is given as a a requirement and standard for pastors in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but I believe this is something that each and every Christian is also challenged to do in their lives. Philippians 2 says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. That's given to us as Christians. We are to be standing blameless and harmless. We should be a light to the world. In 1 Peter 1.15, we know this verse, but as he is which called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So how's your testimony? Samuel's was one of doing right, one of following after God. And he wasn't perfect, we know that. Uh, He made mistakes. Uh, I mentioned just a minute ago when he appointed his sons as judges, that was a mistake. It wasn't something God had commanded him to do. That was something he took on himself. Instead of trusting God's plan, he said, I got to figure out this next step. And so he made mistakes. But even in that case, when he was confronted, he did the right thing. Samuel, though, is really just pointing to his leadership, his position as a judge and saying, you know what, I've always sought to do right. And I've preached on this recently, and we understand this. The Christian life is not a life of perfection, but a life of progression. Okay, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect in life, but we are to be continually becoming more and more like Christ, continually allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us and to change our lives. And oftentimes, though, we get hung up. We get hung up on our past and the sin and the things maybe that we allowed into our lives or the things we were involved in. And we say, uh, you know what? I can't be like Samuel. I can't say that from a child till now I've had a life that's above reproach. But what you can do is you can say, you know what? I'm going to determine that 
each day of my life from today on, I want to live a life without reproach. You can't change your past. You can't change where you've come from. But you can determine to go forward living a life that's holy before God. So how is your testimony before others? Samuel's, it was one of doing right. From his childhood until the point where he says, he says, I've done right. But what is your testimony? Samuel continues his final address and he moves on to start talking about God's righteous acts. Look at verse 6. And Samuel said unto the people, it is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. He points out a very simple truth about who brought them out of Egypt. Who brought them to where they are? He says, it was the Lord who did this. The Lord advanced Moses and Aaron. It was God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The word advanced uh, speaks of this idea of being made, something being made or something being raised up. So really, Moses and Aaron, he's saying, had nothing to do with the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. But God had everything to do with it. God had made those two men. God had raised them up to that leadership position. God had used them to accomplish his plan. In verse 7, now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. Samuel says, I'm going to start rehearsing some things for you, what God has done for you. And he points out to them that these are God's righteous acts. Verse 8, when Jacob was come into Egypt and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. And the Lord sent Jerubel and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwelled safe. God had delivered Israel out of Egypt. He had opened the Red Sea. He had provided manna for them. He had parted the Jordan River. He had given them the victory over Jericho. He was responsible for everything that the nation of Israel was able to call their own. And uh, Samuel is reminding them of that fact. And as Christians, we need to be reminded of that fact too. Everything we have comes from God. The ability to work, the health that you have, the job, the career that you have. God has made you. God has raised you up. Don't forget that truth. And he's saying, you know what? I, yes, I have a good testimony, but don't forget that God did all this for you. God brought you here. God brought you through those trials. God brought you into the land. But then he recounts how Israel had forgot God and turned from him. And when they did so, God brought the nations around them that came and, and brought God's judgment against the nation of Israel. But again, he's reminding them that God's judgment was also just and righteous. This is all of his righteous acts. And in the same way, when we turn away from God in our lives, when we turn away from following after him, he is just and righteous when he brings punishment and correction into our lives. In Hebrews, we're told that if we are God's children, we can expect his chastening hand upon us. It says, if he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So as we follow these events that Samuel is rehearsing, it's just a couple of verses. He recounts how the nation cries out to God, repents of their sin, they turn back to God. And when the nation did this, God sent individuals that would be known as judges who came and they delivered Israel from their oppressors. They brought the nation back to peace and they were supposed to lead the nation to follow after God. And in verse 11 at the end, uh, Samuel says uh, that God delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and ye dwelled safe. He's pointing out this pattern, and we've talked about this uh, at the beginning of our study of Samuel, the pattern of judges came and they did right, and then they went away from God, and then judges came and they did right, and then they went away from God, and this pattern of going towards God, repenting, and then turning away from God. And he says, God brought you into this land, God provided everything you needed, and then you turned from him. And I think he's trying to remind them, don't do this again, you, you are doing this again. You've gone from following God to following after your own wants to wanting a king. And he's clear in these verses that everything that God does, whether it is good or bad in our eyes, is just and is righteous. So what does that mean? That means that everything that God does is morally perfect. Okay, God's character is perfect. His nature is perfect. His rule is perfect. His actions are perfect. 
That's really what righteous means, is that he is morally perfect. So when Samuel says this is God's righteous acts, it means they are perfect acts. They are what God intended. Sometimes it's hard for us to accept that all of God's acts are righteous acts. Because we don't understand what's going on or we don't understand why God would allow something in our lives, but we have to trust in him and recognize that he is just and that he is righteous. God extending his mercy and grace to us as sinners in salvation, that's just and righteous. Okay, to most people in our world, that's not just and righteous. We are sinners, we have done wrong, there should be punishment. Yet God extending his mercy and grace is just and righteous. God may be giving mercy and and saying, you know what, I'm withholding an earthly punishment or something or consequence in someone's life. We might say, I don't understand that, but that's just and righteous. God allowing a trial or a difficulty into your life is just and righteous. God chastening us for our sins is just and righteous. And Samuel is reminding the Israelites that all that God does is righteous, and we need to remember that as well. Every act of God is righteous. We need to keep that in mind as we go through life because it's easy to start complaining and say, hey, God, why why is this happening? Why did they get this? Why did they get that? Instead of saying, okay, God is just and righteous. I don't understand it. I don't know what's going on, but I know that this is a righteous act of God. After recounting God's work, Samuel says, okay, here's the choice you made, Israel. Look at verse 12. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, you said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. Now therefore, behold the king whom ye have chosen, and whom ye have desired, and behold, the Lord has set a king over you. There again, a reminder to Israel of the choice that they had made to turn away from God and to instead seek a man to be their king. He says, God's done so much for you. God's delivered you out of Egypt. He's brought you into the land. He's rescued you from your enemies. He sent judges when you need them. And now when you're faced with the Ammonites, you instead cry out for a king. And what he's referring to is what happened back in chapter 11 of 1 Samuel. The Ammonites come to attack and the Israelites, instead of crying out to God, instead of seeing how God would deliver them, because he did it back in chapter 7, we saw how they cried out to God and we're told that God thundered with a great thunder on the Philistines and uh, discomfited them. So they had just seen this happen not too long ago, but instead of crying out to God, they instead sought a flawed man instead of the perfect God. And that last phrase of verse 12, they said, Nay, but a king shall reign over us. But then it says, When the Lord your God was your king. They had God as their king, and yet they were wishing for something else. Who is your king tonight? And I know I've talked about this in a couple of our last messages. Is God your king? Does God have complete rule over every area of your life? Or have you shut him out in favor of ruling your own life? The nation of Israel thought, you know what, we know better. We want a king. We want to be like everybody else. We want to have this king to lead us. And they turned from following God to following after a man. And in verse 13, Samuel basically says again, here's your king. Here is your choice. Here he is. This is what you wanted so badly. This is what you chose. And then he launches into some conditions that God gives. Look at verse 14. If ye will fear the Lord. Here's a condition. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your father's. Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord and he shall send thunder and rain that ye may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which ye have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. So Samuel called unto the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel and all the people said unto Samuel, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. God basically says, if you want to follow me, fear me, serve me, obey me, and don't rebel against me. But if you make that choice to disobey, to rebel, there will be punishment. And when you look at verse 14, God doesn't tell Israel that if you do these things, then here's great blessing that's going to come. All that's promised that if they do those things, then they will continue to follow the Lord their God. That's all that was promised. And it seems like a given, right? If you fear God and give him the reverence that he's due, if you serve him and obey him 
and you don't rebel against them, then you are following God, aren't you? But he gives these conditions against, about judgment as well. He says, if you don't, if you don't obey the Lord, if you don't fear him, if you rebel against him and his commandments, then the hand of the Lord is going to be against you. They knew what it meant, Samuel said, as it was against your fathers. They had seen God's hand. They had seen God's punishment on the nation already. And Samuel's warning them that if they turn from God, they will face punishment again. And as we saw earlier, whatever punishment or judgment came upon them is a righteous act, a righteous punishment, a righteous judgment. Today, we have the ability and the opportunity to have a relationship with God. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, that's the first step. But if you've trusted in Christ alone for salvation, you have a relationship with God. And we don't often think of it. But the fact that the creator of the universe desires to have a relationship with us should amaze us, should cause us to be in awe of him. And I think it's sort of, Samuel's like, come on, guys. <laughs> Your God, the God that you worship, the God that is giving you these commands is the God of the universe. Look at everything he's done for you. Look at how he worked. Look at how he brought you out of Egypt. Why don't you say, you know what? I don't want a king. I want to serve him. In Psalm chapter 8, the psalm tells us, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? The psalmist is saying, I'm in awe when I look around me. I'm in awe that God thinks about me, that he is mindful of me, that thou visitest him. We should be in awe that God says, I want to have a relationship with you. It should be our attitude each and every day. Ah, that the, only, or the one and only God, the creator of the universe, he knows our name, he knows our trials, he knows our hurts, and he says, I want to have a relationship with you. And our desire should be to follow verse 14, to fear God, to serve him, to obey him, to not rebel against him or his commandments. And when we do those things, guess what? We'll be following after God. It's really sort of a no-brainer. But oftentimes we say, you know what, I want to follow God, but I don't want to fear him, give him the reverence he's due. I don't want to serve him. I don't want to obey him. Okay, uh, Andre gave this as his testimony, not giving up certain areas of our life. He mentioned things like what I watch and things like that. Sometimes we say, you know what, I want to watch this, <laughs> and so I'm not going to give God the reverence he's due in that I'm saying, you know, I fear God. I'm not going to put that in front of my eyes. I'm going to obey him, and I'm not going to put uh, something before my eyes that is not pre, uh, pure. I'm, not, uh, I'm going to serve him. And so we say, you know what, I want to follow God, but I don't want to do those things. But if we do those things, we'll be following God. Because of God's mercy and grace, we've been offered the gift of salvation through Jesus and his sacrifice for us on the cross. But the Bible also tells us that God is also a God of justice and righteousness, which means he must punish sin. So as a Christian, God's justice, his righteousness is satisfied in Christ's death on the cross. So if you've trusted in Christ, you're not going to face an eternity separated from God in hell. That payment has been made, but we still sin. He mentioned it as well. Andre mentioned it as well. We have the old and the new nature, right? They fight. Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that, that they war. And so as a loving father, when we do sin, God chastens us. We just saw that verse in Hebrews 12, but let's read it again. If ye endure chastening, so if you see God's hand of chastening in your life, he dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So again, saying that if you are a son, you will face chastening. As we continue what we just read, Samuel says, here's a sign that's going to come from God that shows you that you guys have been wicked in seeking a king. The sign comes to pass and the people seem to recognize their sin and they cry and they say, Samuel, cry out. They say, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. They say, pray to the Lord thy God. It was supposed to be their God, wasn't it? But we sort of see how far they had strayed from God being their king in this verse. They no longer refer to him as our God, but as Samuel's God. Maybe it was a feeling of unworthiness on their part, saying, okay, we recognize our sin, so how can we come to God? How can we call him our God when we've sinned and turned away from him? And to be honest, I'm struck at how often this happens in our lives as Christians as well. We stray from God, we sin, we turn from God, and then we come to a pastor and say, pastor, pray for us. And to be honest, that's good. As your pastor, I want to pray for you. Pastor Connor, as your pastor, wants to pray for you. 
But I also want to pray with you, not just for you. Each one of you here that knows Christ as your Savior, you have access to the throne of grace. In Hebrews, we're told that we can come boldly before that throne. And I know that sometimes there's that feeling of unworthiness. Well, I've done this. I have sinned in this way. I can't come before God. I need somebody else to do this for me. I don't deserve to come before God. But that isn't true because God wants to hear from his children. You really don't need me to pray for you. I will. I want to. But you have the ability to go to God on your own. And sometimes it feels like people say, Pastor, please pray to your God for me. That's not how it should be. So God gave some conditions. He says, if you'll do this, you'll be following after me. If you do this, you'll face my punishment. And then Samuel's final words. They begin with hope in verse 20. Samuel said unto the people, fear not. Ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. <coughs> he starts by telling the people to fear not. He doesn't ignore their wickedness. He doesn't ignore their sin. But he does give them a challenge. He says, fear not, and he gives them hope. They had sinned against God, but they've recognized their sin in verse 19. They've asked Samuel to cry out to God on their behalf. And we'll see as we continue in this study, the nation faces the consequences of their sin and their decisions. They face the consequences of their turning away from God. But in verse 20, he's, he's really challenging them to continue to serve the Lord. He says, yes, you've done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord. Continue forward, continue to follow God. And it's a lesson we need to learn today as well. We often feel like once we've made a mistake, once we've failed, then we can't continue to follow after God. Maybe it's something big or something small, but we get this feeling that, you know what, I keep messing up. And so, you know what, there's no way I'm saved or there's no way that God wants to use me. And maybe I'm the only one. I've had that feeling before. The devil loves to bring up the past. He loves to bring up our sins and says, you're not worthy to serve God. You're not worthy uh, to follow God. And to be honest, none of us are worthy. There's only because of God's grace that we are able to live for him and to serve him. I love that verse where Paul says, it's only by the grace of God that I am what I am. Because it's not, not of us. And so Samuel says, you know what? You've done wickedly, yes. But continue to follow God. If you're here tonight and you say, well, I've messed up. Well, first, you need to confess your sin to God. You need to seek his forgiveness. Maybe you say, you know what? I need some counsel. You need to talk to myself or Pastor Connor. But then you need to continue forward following after God. Don't just abandon it. Don't just give up on it, but say, okay, now I'm going to continue forward. Don't let your past mistakes undermine the future that God has for you. He's waiting for you to come to him. He's waiting to forgive you. He's waiting to restore you and to give you then what you need to continue forward for him. And so Samuel's really challenging the people. He says, put the past behind you. You've messed up. Fear not. Yes, you've messed up. Your wickedness was great. You've done this wickedness, but turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart and turn ye not aside. He says it twice. Don't turn aside from following after God. Continue after him. And in verse 21, he says, when you turn aside, you're turning to vain things. Really, the word vain is the, uh, has the sense of being worthless. So he says, anything outside of following after God is worthless. It can't profit or deliver you. He's just gotten done saying everything from the coming out of Egypt and the deliverance out of Egypt to the land you're in now, it's all come from God. It's not come from your own power, your own strength, your own ability. And if we look at the nation of Israel, the only time they saw success, that they saw themselves prosper was when they were following God. When they went their own way, it ended in pain and judgment from God. And so Samuel's saying, you know what? Anything else other than following God is vain. It's worthless. It does nothing for you. And can I challenge you tonight? The things of this world are vain. They're worthless. They have no meaning for eternity. They have no true and lasting power. But I know many of us that tonight could say we have turned from following God at some point in our lives to following after things that are worthless. Maybe you're in that position now. It's a career or money or a relationship or a lifestyle you want to live, and you've turned away from that or away from following God to something that is worthless. It can't profit or deliver you. The only one who can do that for you is Christ. 
Think about it. Your career can be taken from you pretty easily. Your money can disappear very quickly. Your relationships can fail. The only one who will not fail you, who will not leave you, is Christ. He is always with you. And if you look at the next thing that Samuel tells the nation in verse 22, he says, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. He says, All those things you followed after, whether it was a false god or whatever it was you were going after, those are vain, they're worthless, they don't profit you, they can't deliver you, but God is still there. God will not forsake you. God will not leave you. He says, you are God's people. God has chosen you. God's name is attached to you. And because of who God is, his great name's sake, he's not going to leave you. As Christians, we have the same promise in Hebrews 13. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. There's a whole message in that verse. Don't live a life of covetousness, but be content with what you have because God is with you doesn't mean we don't strive to better ourselves but it does mean that through it all we are content because we're trusting in god we're trusting in his plan and if you're saved tonight you are a child of god you are called by his name he will never leave you or forsake you verse 23 says moreover as for me god forbid that i should sin against the lord in ceasing to pray for you but i will teach you the good and the right way samuel says you know what you've asked me to pray for you i'll do that God's placed me in this position of leadership as a judge, and part of my responsibility is to pray for the people to bring them before God. And he's really saying, just because you have chosen a king over God does not lessen my responsibility that I have to you as still a judge. God didn't really, if you're looking here, God didn't remove him from being judge. God brought a king in, but God didn't remove Samuel. And we'll see that as we keep going. People go to Samuel, and Samuel pronounces judgment from God. And so Samuel says, yes, I will continue to pray for you. I will continue to teach you what is right and wrong. Uh, In the same way, if you choose to reject God and you choose to reject the pastor God's given to you, guess what? It doesn't diminish the responsibility that I and Pastor Connor have to preach God's word and to pray for you, to challenge you with what God's word has to say. And Samuel says, I'm going to continue doing that. I will pray for you. I will preach and teach the, uh, the people the good and the right way. And like I said, he disappears a little bit after this chapter. We don't see him addressing the nation again, but we do see him coming through at at important moments. And I do believe that we would be safe to assume that Samuel continued to teach the people and to try to get the people to follow after God and to challenge them and to challenge the king. We'll see him do that in challenging the king to obey God and follow him. But Samuel ends his final address with one last challenge and warning. Verse 24. He says, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye, if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. Once again, the challenge, fear the Lord. Give him the reverence, the honor that he is due. Serve him in truth. And he says, here's the reason why. Consider how great things he hath done for you. Basically, remember all that God has done for you and continue to follow after him. Just because they had a king did not change the fact that God was still the king. God was still on the throne. And he says, consider, consider all that God has done for you. We have a verse very similar in Hebrews. It says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. It's a challenge to us as Christians to consider Christ. To consider the one who went to the cross for us, the one who gave his life so that we could have eternal life, the one who willingly went to the cross so that we could be saved. We should consider him and then we should fear and reverence him and serve him in truth with all of our hearts. He ends the chapter saying, here's another warning. If you turn from God, if you continue in your wickedness, then you can expect to face God's judgment. Ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. Once again, Christian, yes, you are saved for eternity. That's settled if you've trusted in Christ. But when you turn from God, when you continue in sin, you can expect that God, who is holy and just and righteous, is going to bring chastisement. And if you don't face chastisement, if you look at Hebrews, you should ask, am I a son? God is reaching out to you, trying to get your attention, wanting you to come back to him, 
to seek forgiveness and restoration, but there will come a point where his justice demands a punishment. Don't let your sin get to that point. Turn back to God. Confess your sins. Forsake it and come back to the place of following God in your life. As we end tonight, I want to come back to the title, really, of my message. This whole chapter was Samuel giving his final address to the nation of Israel. He had one last chance to address the entire nation, to challenge them about the direction that they were going. He had one last, ch- last chance to point them in the right direction, to encourage them to follow God with their lives. And everything that he challenged the nation of Israel with is a challenge to us as well. So as we end, I'm going to recap. First of all, what is your testimony to others? The word testimony, the basic definition, is a statement for the purpose of establishing and recording truth. Testimonies or witnesses that do otherwise are false. So your testimony is your life, a statement that is there for the purpose of establishing and recording truth. So is your testimony, the statement of your life, one of an authentic faith that we heard about this morning? Is it a testimony of a faith that works? Or does the way that you live your life tell those around you that your faith is not authentic, it's not real? Maybe your testimony is one of failure. You say, you know what? (laughs) I've messed up a bunch of times. That's what people know me for is that I'm going to mess up. Remember, don't let your past mistakes undermine the future God has for you. He wants to forgive and restore and then take you forward for him. He wants to work in your life. He wants you to grow, or to grow you to become more like him. He wants to change you, but you have to be willing to let him. Don't let your past sin or your past failures keep you from following after God. Give your past to God. Seek his forgiveness and restoration, and then press forward for him. So what's your testimony? But second, how is your attitude toward God? Hey, every act of God is righteous, morally perfect, Maybe you've lost sight of that fact. You are questioning God because of what's going on in your life right now. Maybe you're facing a trial or a difficulty. Maybe you're feeling God's chastening hand in your life. Remember, everything that God does, good or bad in our eyes, is righteous and just. Maybe you just need to ask God to say, Lord, help me to accept your working. Help me to trust you through it all. Maybe you just need to consider Christ more tonight. And they say, you know what? I want to just take time to consider what Christ has done for me. I know I don't do that enough in my life to say, you know what? Let me think about what God has done in my life. But when we dwell on what Christ has done for us in our lives, it will then motivate us to go forward in life and to follow after him. And our attitude towards God and to his commandments, it changes when we consider all that he's done for us. When we look at what he has done, that changes our attitude towards him. And we can say, you know what? That's God's righteous act. That's God working in my life. Lastly, who's your king tonight? Does God have complete rule over every area of your life? Or have you said, you know what? I'm going to shut God out in favor of ruling my own life. The best life is a life that's completely submitted to God and his will. When you allow God to reign over every area of your life, then your life is going to be a life that is fulfilling. Will you make the most money that you ever could? Probably not. But you will be happy and fulfilled knowing that you lived your life with God as your king. And that applies to every stage of life. Okay, we love to talk about Brother Marty and Nancy. They gave God complete control over every area of their life. And guess what? They are fulfilled and they are happy doing what God wants them to do. And we'll sit here and go, amen, amen, but are we willing to do that? Are you willing to say, you know what, what does God want for me? And God is moving or God is is convicting me or God is uh, moving me in a certain direction. Are you willing to say, you know what, I'm going to completely submit my life to God and his will. Will I have everything I want in life? Maybe not but I will have the best life I possibly could have. If God is your king, then as Samuel challenged the nation of Israel, you will fear God and reverence him. You will serve him. You will obey him. You will not rebel against him and his commandments. That 
something we all like to do, right? Say, God, I don't understand that one. I don't want to do that. I, I, don't, I don't really feel like maybe that's not what God meant, so I don't want to do that. Don't just say that you want to follow God. Let your actions show it. The Israelites were challenged by God through Samuel to follow after God, but the proof, we'll see, right, it was in their actions, whether they did it or not. So Samuel gives a final address to the nation of Israel, and he made the most of it. So for you tonight, if you were given, like Randy Posh was, one final chance to address your family or your co-workers or your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, what would you say? Would you have anything to say? Would you be able to look back on your life and to say, you know, my testimony was one of following God? Would you be able to say that even in the hard times, I trusted in God's righteous acts? Would you be able to say that, you know what? God was my king and I followed him completely. I believe that as Samuel gave this final address, he was also able to say that he had lived his life according to what he was challenging the nation of Israel to do. He said, look at my life first. Can you see anything in there that I, I have strayed from this? And then he goes on and says, do this, do this, do this. But he was able to say, you know what, I've done this. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. <clears throat> this verse is a challenge to me, and I love this verse because it challenges me. Because the question then is, if I was to give a last address... Would I just be saying, you know what, you should do this, you should do, you, you should do this? Or could I say, you know what, do what I did. I did my best to live for Christ my whole life. I strived to follow after him. And when I failed, I came back to him and then I kept going forward. What would be your last address? Let's have every head bowed and every eye.